And so in 2020, every government is to come forward with a ratcheted up ambitious plan for climate action. This ratcheting mechanism was negotiated between the US and China and the rest of the world agreed that every five years we would improve our ambition as we learned more from technologies, we learned more that worked and as we needed to speed up action. Now, that is still in place. And despite the fact that government is very uh, concentrated on responding to the crisis, by the end of 2020, according to the Paris Climate Agreement, governments are supposed to file their uh, reports. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the first virtual Great Decisions session of uh, the World Boston Great Decisions series. Uh, today we're covering climate change and the global order uh, with uh, Dean of the Fletcher School, Rachel Kite. It gives me very great pleasure to get to the main event uh, by means of introducing Rachel Kite, who is the 14th Dean of the Fletcher School Diplomacy at Tufts, the nation's oldest graduate-only school of international affairs. Uh, prior to joining her, Dean Kite served as Special Representative of the UN Secretary General and Chief Executive Officer of Sustainable Energy for All, which is called c for all um, I uh, will leave her extensive biography for you to see on our website, but I do want to mention that she was recently named one of Time's top 15 women leading the fight against climate change. So Dean Kite, welcome to World Boston's Great Decisions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Will Boston for the invitation and thank you to your partners uh, WGBH and the Lowell Institute for seamlessly moving this from the Boston Public Library uh, online. And to all of you who have uh, joined us today, I hope that you are well and safe uh, wherever you are. The title of this, uh, this discussion, uh, Climate Change in the World Order, was uh, decided upon before uh, COVID-19 took hold um, and that's what I'm going to talk about but I will put it in the context of what is happening and what we can learn from the way in which we uh, understand this crisis, the way in which we respond to this crisis and the pathway forward to a looming climate crisis which is right in front of us. So the world order um, hasn't changed uh, but the current pandemic uh, will have profound effects well past the point where vaccines <laughs> and exposure will have built our immunity to this coronavirus. Climate change is an existential threat and it's already there. It is what we call a grey rhinoceros. It's not a black swan. It's not something we see in the rear view mirror. It is right in front of us. It's large. And we have up until now not responded appropriately or urgently enough to the size of the risk that it poses us. In which case, if we're facing such an extraordinary and existential threat, then our recovery from this crisis must leave us better prepared, more resilient to climate change. And today I'm going to take a look at what that might mean. But first, where are we in our efforts to combat global heating today? So before the crisis hit, 2020 was to be a banner year of climate action. It was five years, or it is five years, since the Paris Climate Accord, where the world came together, everyone, and agreed that we would do everything we could to halt global warming to uh, below or well below two degrees uh, since uh, pre-industrial times. There was a debate about uh, the fact that that has to be done in such a way as we leave no one behind. There is only one boat and one end can't go up and the other go under. We all sink or swim together. And so in 2020, every government is to come forward with a ratcheted up ambitious plan for climate action. This ratcheting mechanism was negotiated between the US and China and the rest of the world agreed that every five years we would improve our ambition as we learned more from technologies, we learned more that worked and as we needed to speed up action. Now, that is still in place. And despite the fact that government is very uh, concentrated on responding to the crisis, by the end of 2020, according to the Paris Climate Agreement, governments are supposed to file their uh, reports. 
Now, of course, the signature event every year is a conference of the parties, and we were ready for COP26, the 26th gathering of the conference of parties, to see whether or not that ratcheting up was good enough. And that was to happen in Glasgow in Scotland in November of this year. That has been postponed. The Paris Climate Agreement isn't uh, isn't al aligned with a meeting. The Paris Climate Agreement says that by the end of 2020, we need to have these plans. Very few of those plans have been received by the United Nations before the crisis hit. And I think it's clear now that those plans have to be embedded in the recovery and the stimulus packages that countries need to respond to this extraordinary economic shock on the back of the pandemic. So we needed to slow warming, we needed to build more resilience, we needed to help the most vulnerable within our communities adapt to climate change. The scientific consensus, which was published most recently in 2018, shows that in fact we need to be well, well below two degrees, we actually need to be at one and a half degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels. And today we are well on track for something above three degrees. So we were not on the right path. The science has said that it is actually possible to get to one and a half degrees. We still have the opportunity to do what we need to do, but every day we make it more difficult for ourselves. It's the difference from taking a gentle curve and needing to execute a handbrake turn. And every day that we don't act, we make it more expensive for ourselves, but be under no illusion that the price of inaction far, far exceeds the price of action. Inaction can be measured in the human health implications of really poor quality air from fossil fuels. The uh, cost of inaction are the millions of people displaced as a result of climate change. So we've talked about where the science has said we are, we've talked about the politics. I think it's very important as well to understand that climate change and the impacts of our emissions don't fall evenly around the world. We're extremely concerned about what is going on in the Arctic and the Antarctic, which are warming faster than other parts of the world. And while we talk about 2050 goals, and you will hear companies and financial institutions and governments making commitments to be at zero net emissions or to be carbon neutral by mid-century, we really have 10 years in which to arrest the warming because if we start to lose control of Arctic climate systems, then we start to lose control of other weather systems around the world. And in fact, of the entire Earth's capacity to balance climate. So um, what, does the economic, uh, what is the economic news? Where were we before the pandemic hit? Well, increasingly, companies are committing themselves to what are called science-based targets. What they are doing is reporting out under pressure from investors, under pressure from young people who want to work at companies where they feel aligned with the values, and under pressure from markets, under pressure from regulators. Companies are beginning to say that in order to be um, profitable, we will align our businesses with the need to be deeply decarbonized and to be participating in an economy which is is net zero uh, by 2050. What's been really extraordinary in the last year is to see companies in what we would call hard to abate sectors committing to these kinds of goals. So this is steel companies and cement companies. It is aviation companies and shipping companies. Now, we are not on track and we are by no means where we need to be, but in each segment of the economy, there are market leaders with these kinds of commitments in place. We've even seen over the last six months, oil and gas companies begin to make similar commitments from Repsol to Bridge Petroleum, BP, to Equinor in Norway, and even to Shell just two weeks ago, leading oil and gas companies are committing to becoming zero net carbon by 2050 as well. What does that mean if you're an oil company? Well, what it means is that they are calculating that they will either not get to the resource out of the ground, the resource and the reserves which are fundamental to the pricing of the company, the valuation of the company, or if they are exploiting those reserves, that they plan to use it, store it, or um, uh, capture it so that the emissions from it will not escape into the atmosphere or they are planning on becoming very different kinds of technology companies and are buying and acquiring uh, uh, renewable energy assets and see themselves moving quickly in that direction. Now we've been there before, but this is something which uh, is matched by a commitment from the financial sector. 
The financial sector is a drag on um, the move towards a low carbon economy in large part. But in the last few years, we have started to see an extraordinary shift in long term investor understanding of carbon risk, of climate risk and of uh, a desire from uh, shareholders in institutions and pension funds to have their uh, savings protected from these kinds of risks. We've seen more than $150 trillion of assets now voluntarily uh, reporting under what we call the TCFD. This is a voluntary framework for reporting on how you will manage your business according to climate risk. One would expect that that voluntary movement will become mandatory if regulators step in. We've also seen a divestment movement with more than $10 trillion of assets moved away from fossil fuels. And this has taken uh, root in college campuses across the US, in pension funds across Europe, Canada, the US and elsewhere. The largest public pension fund in the world, Japan, uh, moved to divest just a few weeks and months ago. So there's a feeling that we were beginning to get to a tipping point where the a number of central banks, uh, the number of finance ministers, the number of institutional asset owners and asset managers, and even some of the leading banks were beginning to understand that they needed to be exiting a business which was not going to provide a return for their investors and was dangerous to the planet. So where do we stand on all of this now with this extraordinary COVID crisis, both public health crisis and now an economic crisis? Make no mistake, we are standing on the edge of not a global recession, but a potential global depression, something that is unprecedented in modern times. The virus has slowed economic activity and is pro providing challenges for every sector of the economy and for almost every country on, on the planet. Recovery will require unprecedented action by governments stepping in and intervening in a way that has been long unfashion unfashionable. It's uh, the last 40 years, really, governments' role in an instrument of, of direction setting has been challenged from right and from left. But we can see glimpses of the future as well as the lure of the past. Walt Siller, the fin Finnish energy company, reported this week that if we compare the first quarter of 2020 to the first quarter of 2019, across the European Union and the UK, we see that coal in energy generation has been reduced by 25%. The energy demand is down by 10% and emissions associated with energy are down by 20%. Even more interesting is that year over year, renewables now are providing 45% of the energy across the entire EU and the UK. So the sky did not fall. Renewable energy can take up the burden and can be uh, a part of an energy mix without disruption. Now, of course, the oil prices have plummeted in recent weeks as well, in large part because of the collapse in demand. But with oil prices low, an industry that was already struggling for relevance with investors. I think Exxon's share price has reduced by 70% over the last six years. With valuations being challenged, now we have real important decisions to be made with the public money we use in order to get out of this crisis. Why would we continue to provide harmful fossil fuel subsidies to, uh, to companies when we could use that money to provide the subsidy for clean and affordable energy to the most vulnerable in our society and work with companies to manage what will have to be a transition away from fossil fuels sooner rather than later. It's not just the energy sector, 25% of global emissions come from land use and from agriculture. Energy systems may be broken, but our food system is broken too, and that's been laid bare by this crisis. What we really need is affordable diets that can be provided in a, in a healthy and nutritious way, but in a way that doesn't also harm the planet. The food system today is killing the planet, but it's also killing us with chronic disease from heart conditions to diabetes being the largest drag on the public budget in many countries. And so in this moment where we are warned of unprecedented famine in sub-Saharan Africa as a result of a collapse of uh, supply chains, uh, problems with exchange rates, and also a locust infestation in East Africa, and at the same time when we watch television images of mile-long queues of people for food packages from Texas to Pennsylvania, 
in this moment when we understand our food production systems therefore to be broken is this a point of recovery where we can move towards um, the provision of healthy food in a way that is sustainably grown better for the planet where we can preserve soil carbon where we can uh, have local uh, robust and resilient food systems and at the same time improve human health Certainly, it would appear so because in California, Governor Newsom, using federal money and state money, has built a partnership whereby money will be provided to restaurants that are on their knees economically to produce healthy meals for seniors using locally produced food. Sort of taking three things that aren't working, putting them together and finding a solution. This is the kind of climate response we are going to need to see. Yesterday, the UN Secretary General put a six point plan for recovery to a climate resilient economy. He talked about first the need for jobs that have to come in this immediate stimulus to be in the clean and green parts of the economy. So shovel ready jobs we remember from 2008, but shovel ready jobs in the renewable energy sector, in the deep refurbishment and energy efficiency we need in our buildings, in new energy infrastructure, for example, green hydrogen, offshore wind off the coast of Massachusetts. The second, that taxpayers' money, public money, should go for things that will promote green and inclusive growth. The French government today, in its proposed bailout of Air France, has said that the condition for that public money is that Air France must cut by uh, half the emissions per person and per mile by 2030 in all of its operations. Third, the Secretary General talked about deploying all of our fiscal firepower to move economies from grey to green. And that really the watchwords of recovery and of our fiscal policy and interventions will have to be that everything needs to be clean, green, safe and fair. Fourthly, the Secretary General talked about the need for public investment in the future. So to end the, 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 the stupid things that we do now, and that's what we've talked about for more than 10 years. So end the subsidies which are harmful and use those precious finances for things which will be really supportive of inclusion and green growth. Put a carbon price on and send a signal to the market that we want less of that and we want more of something else. Fifthly, he talked about a global financial system where every decision has to incorporate climate risk. That is the role of regulators and we look to central bank governors in their coordination to be able to do that. But it also means that for private, private investors, they should not be investing in assets which will become stranded sooner rather than later as a result of the extraordinary shock to the economy experienced by this pandemic. And sixthly, he talked about the need for international collaboration at a level that we have never seen in recent years. It has eluded us in recent years. We have been incrementally slow walking into the future, ignoring those grey rhinos of uh, existential threat in front of us. Can we find it within ourselves to prop up the institutions that we have today so that they can do what they need to do and look later at whether or not they need to be improved from the World Health Organization to the International Monetary Fund? And then can we take some time to think about what are the institutions and the forms of collaboration we need for the future? A year ago, almost to the day, Greta Thunberg spoke to the European Parliament the charismatic 16 year old from Sweden that has managed to get hundreds of millions of young people striking every Friday. She's called for cathedral thinking, to have the ambition by looking up. And if we look up today, we look up to blue clear skies with no uh, trails from airlines, with no pollution. Can we find it in ourselves to look up today, to imagine the building of a cathedral of a new international order that would be one that would be for future generations. The stonemasons of the medieval ages, the stone ages of the Renaissance, were building a cathedral that probably wouldn't be finished until their grandchildren were stonemasons. Can we build something that will last and be appropriate for those future generations? So the Secretary General is basically asking us to do no harm to the future economy that must be clean, green, safe and fair in the immediate stimulus packages that we put forward now. And then as we think through past this rescue phase into recovery, 
that we really place some serious bets on the infrastructure that we need, the land management that we need, and the resilience that we will need in order to uh, manage uh, and adapt and survive what is truly the existential threat, which is unchallenged, unabated climate change. I'll leave it there. There is so much else to be said. The Secretary General ended his speech yesterday with Angela Merkel at the Petersburg Climate Summit by saying that the darkness is always darkest just before the dawn. I think that we should be hopeful that we have it within ourselves to build a new international order, but it will require every single one of us. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dean. Uh, we'll now start doing some questions. Ruel, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. go ahead. Okay. Mike, uh, my question is, um, Assuming that the, the developed countries, which uh, like China and the United States, are able to get our act together soon enough, we still have a large fraction of the world, in the undeveloped world, or less developed world, I should say, um, which is living very dependent on carbon-based energy for their, uh, for their growth. And they don't have the resources or access to capital to um, enter into these technologies that might save them. What can what uh, or what is the international community uh, doing in order to um, in, in order in order to um, uh, mitigate this and improve it, get them to the level that we hope the developed countries will get to? Varel, thank you for the question. It's a great question. Um, so you're you're exactly right. Uh, you know the G20 accounts for 80% of emissions and probably the most important climate change document that will uh, come out this year will be the 14th five-year plan from, from China, uh, which um, will be fundamental in whether or not as an as a international community we're able to meet our goals. I think it's very important then to also look at the large um, fast-growing economies of, of uh, India, Brazil, Indonesia within the G20. But then when we look more, more broadly, you're right, there are countries who are 70%, 90% dependent on fossil fuels and where the fossil fuels are owned by the state in national oil companies. Helping these countries through the transition is going to be a critical part of success. So at the moment where most countries are going to the IMF and asking for support as a result of the economic downturn of the crisis, they're going to get budgetary support from multilateral development banks and from the IMF. And that money will go into public budgets and it will go to prop up, for example, a national oil company, unless some kind of uh, additional support to help the country um, manage a transition is provided, and unless there are some kinds of um, uh, your conditions or some kinds of incentives put on the use of that money from international organizations. That is a subject of furious debate at the moment, um, but I think there's also a, a significant question around the levels of sovereign debt that is going to be uh, built up by these countries. You know, we have, more, I think, more than 100 countries have asked the IMF for help. Um, that is going to increase indebtedness, and we've never seen this level of indebtedness globally. And normally, debt is, is correlated to fragility. So I think there's some important deep thinking that needs to be done. And I can't quite imagine at the moment that we get through the next year or more without a, a major international gathering to look at these issues. But just to say that there are emerging markets that show the pathway forward from Morocco to Chile to Argentina, uh, uh, to uh, some of the plans at, you know, in the United Arab Emirates and to parts of uh, Asia and even within uh, Bangladesh and India, you can see how uh, renewable energy can be installed at scale. You can see how a goal can be set and how private and public participation can be attracted in. What happens now with capital flight out of these countries uh, back to the uh, global north, we will have to see. But there are countries that have shown that they can um, execute a very fast transition away from fossil fuels. Uh, and international funds and support will have to be there for the extraordinary wind, um, geothermal, hydro, and wind resources that exist in many of these countries. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question here that was sent in uh, from Irv Kempner. He's here in Massachusetts. And um, in, in some, uh, one of the ways 
that we could look at his question, um, the way he initially posed it, what have we learned about climate change uh, from the global shutdown? Uh, in other words, um, there's been some unintended positive consequences, uh, you know, uh, bluer sky, cleaner water. Um, are there any uh, lessons that, uh, good lessons that we can take from this bad time um, as we look at climate change? Yeah, so this is an excellent uh, question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, I, I, there's two, 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 as many ways to answer this, but just two for today. First of all, I do think that in a number of developed countries, in particular, there may be a reset in public attitudes uh, or an appreciation of what is important to us. And you know, from the uh, television images, I don't know if you saw it, of the goats running down the high street in Langothlin, which is a small Welsh town not very far away from where my family comes from. Uh, the sort of, uh, you know, the fact that you're listening to birds and not to air, airplanes overhead, that the sky is blue, that you can stand in northern India and see the Himalayas uh, mm. over the border in Nepal. I think these, these will have an impact on uh, priorities and an understanding of what we have done by keeping nature at bay. Nature-based solutions are a very, very important part of climate change. And of course, by encroaching more and more into what should be wild areas, uh, we obviously have been at the origin of the pandemic anyway, as we look at the process of zoonotic uh, transfer of disease. But I think secondly, you, you are seeing people already acting to, to, um, to take advantage of roads that are not clogged with cars, uh, sky, uh, air that is uh, clear and clean. Um, so I think that, you know, the mayor of Milan, for example, has already um, looked at changing the entire traffic flow uh, in, in the centre of the city and having that be a permanent thing. And we're seeing city leaders around the world looking at what they're learning from this and what they can do in terms of planning. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think the silver lining narrative is a dangerous one because nobody ever wanted to make a point about climate change by condemning hundreds of thousands of people to death. Um, but there is a golden opportunity and we see some leaders moving uh, to, to seize that. Thank you. I wonder actually if you could um, uh, a little bit more about something that you just touched on. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the link between climate change and the possible origins of this virus um, and or similar viruses? Um, if uh, the climate change, uh, if, if, it, if it rolls on, uh, can we expect more viruses like this, more pandemics? And if, could you um, help us understand that link a little bit? So, so over the last uh, decades, we have rapaciously been um, you know, eating into uh, nature's wildest places, into biodiversity hotspots. And we have through processes of deforestation and expansion of urban areas and um, expansion of agriculture, we have been moving into territories which, are, which as a species um, are not our domain. Um, and of course, as soon as we put um, ourselves in proximity with uh, wild, um, with uh, wild, with wildlife, when we put our uh, husbanded animals for food into contact with wild animals, then the transfer of a disease, a zoonotic disease, a disease that can jump from one species to another and from a, an animal species to a human species, then, then this, this is more likely to happen. And this was, um, you know, this, this, this is not a new story. Um, this has been uh, an urgent um, action item um, since before the first outbreak of uh, you know the SARS pandemic in, in more than 12 years ago and is something that has been well understood in in the world of uh, conservation in the world of biodiversity action and in fact this year I talked about the climate talks that were to take place in November in uh, Scotland uh, but this year was also to be um, uh, the, uh, the, t the call, there was to be an extraordinary uh, summit uh, related to biodiversity and nature to be hosted in China uh, in the fall. 
Um, and much of the discussion, the policy discussion is around how do you protect nature and act on climate change? Because actually nature is one of your greatest protections to climate change. So when we cut down those forests, we encroach closer to where we may actually put ourselves at risk from zoonotic disease. We also take away the carbon sequestration capability of that forest and we allow then through agricultural or other activity uh, the uh, uh, emissions to release from soils and so it's really a triple negative. Okay thank you. We'll uh, go to Eleanor Harvey. Uh, Eleanor we're going to move you over into questioning mode. Microphone come on. Let's see if we can see you, Eleanor. Hello. There we are. Hi, go ahead with your question. Um, so you were discussing how obviously to solve the issue of climate change, it's going to require a, a level of international cooperation that we haven't seen um, in recent times. Um, my question is whether you think that's possible right now, because looking at the trends in the news, um, uh, we're seeing the world increasingly drifting towards a sort of bipolar order between the U.S. and China, um, and right. we're not seeing that trend dissipating, even though everyone in the world is facing an imminent, imminent life-threatening challenge that could clearly be solved um, more effectively if everyone wants to work together. Um, okay. So how do you see you know the international order being able to respond to or work together on climate change in a way that it hasn't been able to respond to other types of challenges so uh, great question eleanor if you have the answer to that then the, the world is your oyster um so two things first of all uh, i think the current structures are really under stress and so uh, we, are in the, we are in the teeth of a crisis where we need to be acting every day. And so we have to sort of put scaffolding around the WHO, around the IMF, around the UN, around the different agencies that we normally would rely on in a moment like this in order to get us through the next few weeks. Um, I think that it was extraordinary that the IMF meetings were, were not able to agree uh, more than they did and the, the a proposal for special drawing rights um, uh, was uh, sort of bounced out of the US Treasury as, as something that they couldn't agree to at this time. I think it's extraordinary that the G20 health ministers were only able to come out with a sort of small statement and that the 52 paragraphs of negotiated text which had a detailed outline of how everybody would work together were not able to come forward. I think it's extraordinary that the UN Security Council has barely met on this subject. Um, I think it's extraordinary that we only have one, you know, fairly generic General Assembly resolution on this subject. Um, and I could go on. So, so we have to put scaffolding around and keep working uh, as we know how to do uh, to try to keep moving forward. And there are, there is a sort of collective effort, I think, to, to do that at the moment. And then we have to think about, well, well what, what do we understand about globalization post the pandemic? I actually think that we've got sort of three tectonic uh, uh, plates now moving slightly apart from each other. Um, I don't know if it's post-globalization, I don't know what we will call it, but I think that, and we were seeing this before the pandemic, so China, Europe, and the US mm -hmm. as the centers of three plates moving in slightly different speeds. I think this is revealed in different attitudes towards privacy and, uh, and artificial intelligence and, internet and information technology. I think that may become even more apparent as we see you know, the use of tracking devices in order to manage the pandemic. So I think that's important. I think you've got different attitudes to government regulation around private sector delivery uh, as well. Um, and so, you know, maybe it's, um, you know, we have a world of regionalization, not globalization. I'm, I'm not quite sure. And then what does that mean for the overarching frameworks that we need? Um, I think that we almost need to have, uh, I've called for a sort of a new Bretton Woods, a new, new almost San Francisco conference, and we, we measure success with a blunt instrument called GDP. GDP does not internalize the externalities of nature and it does not uh, really put a value on what we have to invest in health and education and other social welfare 
and yet that's how we measure success. So is this now the time to embrace well-being budgets, which we see a number of countries, Finland, New Zealand, small countries notwithstanding, but with a vision around this, starting to introduce these. And of course, we've had US candidates um, in the elections calling for you know, fairly far reaching uh, resets around the way we think about supporting the most vulnerable in our societies. So. I think that we've got to, um, you know, work with what we've got, make sure that it can function. Um, and you saw the response to the US withdrawal with WHO, which is everybody else coming in saying, no, we need to use the WHO. This is the framework. And we saw private money coming in to, you know, offset some of the risk of public US money withdrawing. Um, that's a stopgap. It's a band-aid. Uh, and then we will need to think about... Um, how to build the institutions we need. But at the end of the day, even if we are now in a, a sort of quasi cold war with China, where the West has to reconsider its vulnerability if every supply chain starts or moves through China at some point, you know, even, even in that, that point, we have to keep talking. And my former boss at the World Bank, Bob Zelik, had a, a very nice piece uh, in, in, uh, before a book that he's written, is published in August, talking about how to keep talking even when one disagrees. And I think that that's something the US has done under most administrations um, and will need to continue to do. Thank you. Uh, I actually have a, a question from uh, Leslie Griffin that's an interesting bookend uh, to what we were just talking about on the global level. Um, she wonders um, when, uh, for example, uh, withdrew from the climate accords across America, say, said they'd uphold the goals. So um, what are the prospects, that's just an example, what are the prospects for uh, subnational, uh, regional, even local e efforts? Uh, for their making a difference in addressing climate change. Yeah, so I think there's a very, very good point. I mean, we we saw when when the when President Trump announced in the Rose Garden in June 2017 that um, uh, that uh, he would withdraw from the Paris Agreement over a process of four years. You can't just walk away. Um, there's this incredible response from towns, cities, states, um, and that has really um, you know, deepened and broadened into really quite extraordinary uh, action. Uh, and you know, it, it's one could argue that it could go even faster if you had the federal government acting as a positive force, you know, pulling everybody forward. But you know, with the absence of that, then there has been extraordinary work done. And I think what's interesting post the crisis is that you've seen, for example, the governors of the, of the, the Northeast come together and say that they're going to work on how to exit the, right. this stage of the pandemic together. And same for the Midwest, same for the Western governors. And, you know, and in the Northeast, we have experience with REGI and then the Climate Transport Initiative that was just announced before the pandemic. Um, we have, uh, and then we have the announcement from Massachusetts, even in the course of the pandemic, that they will actually commit to 2050 and being carbon neutral. So you see, uh, you see this kind of commitment and Mayor Walsh went to the large meeting of, of mayors uh, in Copenhagen uh, just a few uh, months ago. So I think these, this is real, this is what people want, this is building, but you can see where federal government is needed. So for example, if we were to open up deep water offshore wind energy off the coast of Massachusetts, the coast of the Northeast of the United States, this would be an extraordinary job rich resource and the cheapest form of power that we could possibly have. But for that we do, you know, we, we do need federal government to be, to be benign or, at least, or supportive. So I think it's been fantastic. I think it can still go much deeper. Um, but at some at some point, the, the, you know, it would it would help if the federal government was positive. Just one other thing is that when the Texas Railroad Commission wrote to OPEC in the you know in the discussions around whether or not there could be a deal, um, uh, which became the OPEC plus deal. I mean, markets still um, produce a, an oil price you know hovering around twenty dollars. That was an extraordinary act uh, where you ha would have such a sub-sovereign uh, authority going directly to an international uh, cartel um, to make a point. And, you know, when we sit back and look at global governance post the pandemic, that will be an important chapter. Uh, my question is about leadership. You've described the separation of the three major rich tectonic plates. And yet 
sub-regional uh, agreements uh, hardly make up for the leadership necessary to move the globe forward. So what's the prospect then for leadership, whether it's in the Security Council or, or in the, the Paris Accords reestablishing them uh, and moving it forward? What can the world do without the U.S. or with the reluctant U.S., as is the case now? Uh, well, so what, what the U.S., I mean, so for the, for the U.S., it really becomes an issue of, um, uh, of, of, of the vote, right? I mean, I, I often get asked, especially by younger people, um, and, and by my own students and students at Tufts University, you know, what, what's the one most important thing we can do? And I always say vote. Uh, because, yes, it matters what your diet is. It matters how energy efficient your house is. It matters what car you drive. It matters. All of those choices matter. It matters where your pension is invested. Uh, but vote really matters because you need a leader and we need leaders that will work together with the kind of urgency expected from this kind of, of threat and risk. But I think it is also interesting to look at, there's a, number of, there's a number of leaders at the moment who have been what I would call virus denying, from Bolsonaro in Brazil to, uh, you know, to, to closer to home, uh, to um, even some of the reactions of, uh, uh, in, in, in Salvador, um, and even some of the early uh, approaches by AMLO in Mexico, uh, coming more from the left, uh, but then you have Turkmenistan and, and a couple of other countries where really, you know, strong men leaders have sort of denied the science behind the pandemic and have uh, chosen uh, to sort of um, tough it out uh, with this invisible enemy. And I think that it's interesting because this is um, this is something that we see in authoritarian and uh, populist leaders that they don't want to have scientists uh, close to them or people who are not going to be sort of in the thrall of power as they execute it, that they only want to hear what will uh, continue their power even further. And it's not surprising, therefore, that these leaders are often the ones which are also climate denying. So if they're virus denying, they're climate denying. And so we learn a lot about the kinds of leaders we need given the crises that are coming very fast across the horizon towards us. And that has to be information that people then use and process at the ballot box. There is no way around that. Okay, hi, Stephanie. Hi. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Mary, and thank you so much, Dean Kite. Um, my question is around a new study that the Max Planck Foundation just published a couple of days ago, together with the University of Hamburg in Germany. Okay. And, um, apparently, according to them, they say that even if we get below the 2% target, we will likely see the Arctic Ocean summer will likely be ice free before 2050. And it makes me wonder, and then listening to you um, and to others about possible things we can do to mitigate or to prevent. But when I read things like what I just described, I'm wondering if we have missed a boat on mitigation and if we need to con be con more concerned about adaptation. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit more and perhaps give me a little bit more hope for the future. Hey, Stephanie, so that's an excellent, excellent question. Uh, I haven't, uh, I saw the press releases around this. I haven't looked at this report, but uh, it's in line with uh, other things that we've known. Um, so I don't think you can give up on uh, mitigation and most of the science concurs that, that there's still time, uh, that we haven't run out of time. And so we, we have an obligation to, to try to mitigate uh, as much as, well, as fast as we can in all possible ways. Uh, but I, th I think you're right that, and, and this is where I think that, that, you know, if there is a golden opportunity from this virus, then our understanding of our lack of resilience should spur us towards investing more in resilience because there's been a narrative for about 20 years that you know the more that you invest in resilience the less you have to spend on relief or uh, or recovery um, and so it's 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 a smart economic decision as well as a humane approach as well as a necessary approach but that hasn't actually uh, even produced a, a change in the spending patterns of development aid let alone of, 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 of uh, ordinary budgets so um, have we understood how uh, fragile uh, things are have we understood how um, 
uh, unresilient uh, many uh, many of our societies are have we understood that we are only as strong as the most vulnerable within our society I think that there has been a, that there will be a shift in some public attitudes and hopefully that can be then translated into uh, to, to swifter and more decisive action on mitigation as well as what's going to be needed to invest in public health systems that we will need uh, you know if we are to face climate change on the arctic this is something very close to my heart and at tufts university at fletcher for the last 10 years we have an arctic uh, conference and i think that this is something where we, we look at the Arctic from the perspective of international law, from the science underneath uh, the climate uh, issues for the Arctic, from the issue of political organizations. And you know, the Arctic is of such importance to the world from a climate perspective. It is also important geopolitically. Uh, you, we saw the whole um, sort of discussion uh, between the US and Denmark over the status of Greenland. Uh, China and Russia have their own dialogue going on around the Arctic and yet there is an Arctic Council but this is not a treaty body there's nothing really in charge of governing the Arctic and in fact the Arctic Circle which was stood up has sort of been captured by certain interests so I think one of the you know one of the challenges I lay before my students at Fletcher is you know what is the governance framework how do we govern the Arctic so vulnerable and yet so important to us um, which is just one part of the planet, but which has, if we, if we lose it, if we fail it, then it has implications for everybody else. So don't give up. We've still got time, but every day we don't act, we are simply making it more difficult for ourselves. Thank you. Uh, this is, um, I'm, I'm glad that uh, you brought up the Arctic. It's, it's related to um, a bigger, very interesting question. Um, let's see, who was the person who asked it? Uh, Philip uh, Rombach, um, which nations or actors uh, could actually, it's, it's a cynical question, but could have an interest in a heating climate? Um, and how, how, how do we address climate change if there are actors who are, uh, who are motivated to uh, uh, foster climate change, if you will? So, yeah, so it's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, a decade ago, even in the run up to the Paris Agreement, there was there were countries that believed that they would be beneficiaries from climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, you know, uh, the Russian Federation, um, you know, believed that it would open up uh, greater agricultural productivity in parts of uh, in parts of the country. And, you know, I think there were even some Canadians that thought that, um, you know, balmier temperatures would be good uh, for them as well. I think that that, the, that has been somewhat undermined by the volatility of weather systems. Um, a, so, you know, Russia has experienced extraordinary fires, um, you know, uh, others, uh, just as uh, you know, California has or Australia has. So we've had extraordinary Siberian uh, fires in boreal forests in the last few years. Um, uh, we've also seen um, that the because because the the global heating is happening faster at the poles, we're seeing a much much faster uh, melting of the permafrost, uh, with extraordinary implications because of the methane that is then released into the atmosphere. So this is really an accelerant. Um, that permafrost is a large part of of of. Uh, the northern territories of Canada, of, 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 of Russia, uh, and that has huge implications for the instability of the global climate, so more volatile weather, but it also is the permafrost upon which a lot of infrastructure is laid. Um, and so this is, I think, um, the volatility and the severity with which we're seeing climate impacts coming uh, in some parts of the of the sort of matrix mean that uh, it's not benign and you, you can't imagine that you know oh one degree of warming is going to mean that my wheat production is going to go up I think that we've um, that that is no longer a scenario that is useful from a planning perspective so it's very difficult to see any part of the world benefit economically or socially uh, from from the kinds of impacts we're already seeing as a result of global heating. Okay, great. Um, I'm wondering actually if, if we could uh, circle back to an issue that you touched on um, about uh, oil. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and um, I mean, last week we saw, I mean, it was, you know, sort of unbelievable. Yeah. We saw negative oil prices. 
Um, and of course, the uh, expected happened. Um, United States and I guess other countries as well bought up of oil to uh, prop up the market, put it into our strategic reserves, and now we're you know coasting along at whatever twenty dollars a barrel or something. Um, what should we do? I mean, that's um, it, it, a lot of people work in that industry. It has uh, it has an enormous effect on um, our our stock market. Um, perhaps the the uh, the long term view would be, you know, let them, let them fail. Uh, but clearly that wasn't the response. Um, how, how, do you, how do you see us addressing this, this real cratering of an industry and a significant part of our economy while we pursue positive climate goals? Yes, you're absolutely right. So West Texas Intermediate went negative, which meant that you could be paid to take oil off their hands. And then crude, you know, has been hovering around at 20, and I think WTI is back at like 19, 20 now. Um, so uh, there are a number of things. There are a number of things going on in the industry, which have been exacerbated by the collapse in demand. Um, and so, you know, there has been a rush out of oil stocks by a number of investors in the months before the pandemic because you know people do not want to hold carbon as a risk in their portfolio um so that's not going to change so the question really is this is an industry that um uh you know is limping forward his business model is not a you know a long-term feature uh, of the economy. And so really it's a question of restructuring. Um, and given that this uh, accounts for the, the, li the livelihoods of many people uh, you know, in the US in particular, in the Dakotas, Oklahoma, Texas, this is a, a significant risk. And one would expect um, you know, under normal circumstances that the federal government and state governments would be sitting down and thinking through what does a structural adjustment of this industry look like? Because um, you, know, you need to be able to manage smoothly away from dependence on fossil fuels. Uh, that's what the Paris Climate Agreement means. That's what decarbonizing the economy requires. Um, and therefore, any subsidies that are going to be applied need to be ones which go into um, helping uh, maintain uh, the strategic needs uh, of the country that help uh, people who work in those industries to get retrained and to find other forms of employment uh, that help uh, people who uh, are on low incomes to be able to make sure that they've got access to affordable energy and that should be cleaner. Um, and it doesn't mean that bailouts should then go into the pockets of, um, uh, of owners or investors who you know, have been looking at the trends and have been looking at uh, what's uh, happening to the industry for some time. Now, the, the US is not the only country that will face this, this kind of structural adjustment. Uh, I've talked about national oil companies in developing countries and, and what happens to the public money that they will get access to as they um, uh, try to uh, cope with the crisis. So, you know, I think what, the, what, the, what COVID has done has just bring forward something that was somewhat inevitable. Uh, nobody imagined that they would see this kind of collapse of demand. But now that we've got it, now is the time to make the difficult choices and uh, painful in the short term, but competitive for the US in the, in the long run. Um, and you know, that's the kind of thing that you know, I think that you would be having um, not a White House summit on, but maybe a White House Zoom summit on under normal circumstances. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let me just check. I think we have uh, just about run out of time, unless there's something that you've been dying to say that you haven't managed to fit in? No, I think that, uh, I think that we, we're really at the, uh, depending on where you are in the world, we're in the rescue sort of phase of um, the, the response to uh, this pandemic. We then have to go into recovery phase. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing to watch for is that we don't do anything in this rescue phase that makes the recovery more difficult. And that recovery will have to be a recovery on a different pathway mm -hmm. than the way we had before, the, the, the one we had before. And, you know, it's a sort of last best chance uh, to get this right from a climate perspective. 
um, and we have to be big enough and the institutions uh, at the national level but the institutions that we've depended on at the international level uh, will need to uh, pivot in order to be able to take this last best chance and then maybe we will have to build new institutions for the future. Okay, well, thank you. I wish that as uh, traditionally I, I could join in a ringing round of applause. It's, it's happening remotely. Um, thank you so much, Dean Kite, for uh, being with us uh, today. And uh, thank you all of you who, who Zoomed in from really all over the place, um, many, many different locations, uh, and also here in um, our beloved Boston. Um, to uh, rejoin World Boston virtually, I recommend our uh, session on uh, ne next week on uh, Cinco de Mayo on uh, the Mexican perspective on uh, the COVID vi virus. So thanks again, Dean Kite, and uh, hope to be uh, in touch with all of you soon. <laughs>